Yeah. 
morning. Take a moment and greet each other and pass the peace of Christ.
now we're learning to expand it. Um, so there has been a survey in the bulletin the last three weeks. There is not one in there today. But what we do have, I compiled all the information, and we had about 20 women who responded, which is awesome. And just getting an idea of what everyone is interested in, um, and kind of days a week. Uh, so, but you can still let us know your interest. So there's some sheets um, on the welcome table there, taped on the welcome table. So if you could verify the information for those who did um, respond, and just make sure I typed everything right onto the sheet, say put a check mark, like okay, or something like that. And if you would like to, um, you know, give more, give information if you missed that chance or you have another survey, you can give it to me. Um, but we're going to get going here again real soon. So I'm going to meet with the people who have said they'd be willing to provide some leadership and then we will go from there. But it's really exciting. And one of the pieces of good news is that just about everybody is interested in some type of a women's Bible study or something like that. So we will definitely get that going. We just have to figure out the time and the leaders and all that. So anyway, if you could do that, um, it's it's on the Welcome Center. All right, thank you. Inside your worship folder bulletin, you will find a little envelope like this. We mentioned it in the email this week. But this is for our seminary. And each year we take up a separate offering for our seminary and we send that in. We just we're just trying to participate, so not any special amount that we're asking for, but these envelopes inside your worship folder, if you would like to participate in that, just please drop drop your offering in this envelope and put it in the regular offering in just a moment when our regular tithes and offerings. This is not considered your tithe and offering, it's beside your tithe and offering, something extra. So I have mine here ready to put in as well. So this morning, and if you need to write a check, somebody asked me about this a while ago, you can write a check to the church, put it in here, and we'll, the church then will just write one check to the seminary and send it in that way. Okay? Otherwise, any cash or whatever, put it in here. If you need to write a check, you can make it out to the church, our church, Bonner, and we'll write one check and send it in that way. Okay? So now, if our ushers will come, we'll come for the uh, tithes and offerings as we liberally and cheerfully give to the Lord. I'm sorry that I messed up those songs earlier that we were singing, and that's why you need to be really... Somebody's not praying hard enough for a new worship. <laughs> so, I'm going to blame you all. Until then, until you pray hard enough, you're just going to put up with me. So, that's it. That's the Lord. Turn to ask some blessings, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. You made us a little bit silly, Father, but we want to persevere with your help. Lord, it's time to give our tithes and offerings to you, and we ask that you bless each and every one and the giver, Father. And we ask all this in your face, the Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice shout said, shout. I asked, what should I shout? Shout that people are like the grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. So join us as we continue our worship this morning.
prayer this morning. You can stand with me, or you can sit where you are, or you can come up here and kneel at the altar as we come before the Lord in prayer this morning. Let's do that right now. Whatever posture suits you best, as we come before the Lord. Our anxiety levels increase. 
Lord, other times we feel like we're at our wit's end and we don't know what we're going to do next, but God knows. So, Lord, this morning we take our issues, our problems, our hurts, our pains, our anxieties, our fears, our everything, and we place them at your feet. And we just simply say, Lord, it's all yours. Deal with them according to your will and your way as we walk with you. Touch and guide everyone here this morning. Give them your blessing. Let them know that surely the presence of the Lord is in this place for them. Increase their faith. Build them up in this holy love. Give us of your Holy Spirit. Lord, bless our pastor as he comes to break the bread of life with us today. Empower him with that old thing called unction, Lord, that he might say, this is what the Lord says, and let us have the faith and the hope and the love to hear and obey the word. Come now, Lord. Receive our praise. Receive our gratitude. Receive our love. But then, O oh Lord, hover over us, Holy Spirit, with you. Through Christ Jesus we pray today. Amen.
Oh, I just throw that out there to get your mind turning a little bit. Because our Bible passage today is, is based on a man who's nicknamed Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Thomas was a faithful follower of Jesus. He had proven his loyalty as a disciple when, when Jesus was alive. He had proven that. But Thomas was also a very rational man. And when the other disciples and the women claimed that Jesus had risen from the dead, Thomas was not about to get all excited about it until he saw Jesus with his own eyes. So pick up verse 25 in our, in our passage, John's Gospel chapter 20. Look at verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, he said, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That, of course, happened on the following Sunday evening, as we find here. The Gospel of John goes on to tell us here, verse 26, as we pick it up. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And you know what happens next, right? It's one of the most dramatic scenes throughout the whole Bible in verse 28. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then verse 29, Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You see, so often... We look at this important passage in John's Gospel and we seem to focus on Thomas's doubts. Right? We seem to focus on Thomas's doubts and we say, yes, I can identify with that man. I can identify with that kind of an attitude. And we, we, we focus on his doubts and we miss the punchline. We miss the important part. We miss the words of the Master. Jesus saying to Thomas, verse 29, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's the punchline. That's such an important statement. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now I need to remind you that we're not talking about the smugly self-righteous people or about the, the pious pontificators who spout off answers to questions that people aren't really asking anyway. No, we're, we're talking about people who have come to grips with their doubts and have made a commitment to their will to trust in God. To trust in Him, in the care and in the providence of God. People like us, really. They are indeed the blessed of this earth. They are generally healthier, happier, and generally more effective in relating to others than are the doubters and the cynics in life. It is they who move the world forward. For there's power in believing. More power than the unbeliever can ever know. Power. And part of their power is the power of vision. Part of their power is the power of vision. And you're, you're like scratching your head. Well, wait a minute. Yeah. But, but Jesus just said, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed. Truly, if seeing is believing, then the converse is equally true, right? Believing is seeing. 
seeing possibilities, seeing promises that, that are really good and make a good fortune for all of, the, of those who perceive their, their presence. And so I say it again. Blessed are the believers. Now, some thoughts just randomly come in to me as we as I look at this past. Okay, some thoughts. And the very first thing that I think of is, of course, we have our doubts. Right? We have doubts. All thinking people do. So if you are here this morning and you don't have doubts, you're not a thinking person. <laughs> Right? In fact, I think Woody Allen was right. Faith would be easier if God would show himself by depositing a million dollars in a Swiss bank account in our name. <laughs> Remember when Woody Allen said that a few years ago? Faith would be much easier if God would just do that, right? But God doesn't work that way. God, God doesn't work like that. It's like I, I, read a, I read a true story really recently, a few weeks ago, about a young man named Charlie who was so in love with a charming young lady named Ava. She was in love with Charlie, but so far, this Ava was so in love with Charlie, but so far he had been unable to convince her or persuade her to marry him. Then one day, he invited her to lunch. And they drove to the Los Angeles Coliseum, the largest sports arena on the West Coast. And in the center of that vast playing field were placed a small table and two chairs. A maitre d' showed them to the table. A captain seated them. And a waiter waited behind each chair when they got there. So apart from this little small oasis, the whole Coliseum was empty. Something like over 100,000 seats. Empty seats. Staring down at Charlie and Ava sitting in the middle of the field. The table was elegantly set. Caviar and champagne were served. Then a, a souffle and salad and more champagne. And as they were waiting for dessert, Charlie directed Ava's attention to the, the huge electronic scoreboard at the far end of the field. And in a prearranged signal, he raised his glass and on the board flashed the words, Darling Ava, will you marry me? <laughs> she, of course, said yes. And it's one of the one of the most romantic proposals they say that's been given. But just think about that. When I read that story, I'm like, why can't God do something like that for us? Right? Why can't God do something like that for us? <laughs> it would be easy, right? For God, it would be easy. A, a giant comet streaking through the dark winter night with its tail skywriting in our behalf. I love you, God. Yeah. Right? That'd be so easy for God to do that. But of course, if that were to happen, immediately a group of cynics would get together and they would explain it to us that it was just a freak product of atmospheric pressure and you know, there's got to be a reason why it happened. Don't, don't get too carried away. Right? And they would squelch our excitement. But why doesn't God do something spectacular like that? To let us know that He's there. Why doesn't He do that? Well, I wish I had the right answer for you. But I don't. We'll just have to. We'll just have to question that together. <clears throat> That's part of our doubts, right? We'll just have to trust in that together, because there is part of us that says, with Thomas, unless I can see 
the marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Right? There's part of us that understand that. Because we all long for certainty. We all long for certainty. But that's one gift that God hasn't granted. So that's one thought. Another thought. Undoubtedly, God has his reasons. God has his reasons. You see, if his aim is to produce mature spirits fit to spend eternity in his presence, then it makes sense that he would not reveal himself in his fullness to us. It makes sense that way. Because such certainty would keep us perpetually immature. If we had that kind of certainty, it would keep us perpetually immature. You say, what do you mean? Well, I think maybe we can all understand this. If a child, if a, and I, I know you know where I'm at because I, I hear you talk and, and you, know, you talk about other people's parenting skills and the way they treat their kids. And I do the same. If a child knows that their parent will always be there to solve every problem, to resolve every crisis, to comfort every sorrow, all that, then the child will never develop self-reliance. Right? You, you heard the phrase tough love, and sometimes you just have to let them face it on their own, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the way this is. It just may be that our insecurity is essential to our spiritual growth. It might be. Brendan Manning, in, in his book entitled Reckless Trust, he tells the story of, of John Kavanaugh, a man who went to work with Mother Teresa for three months at the House of the Dying there in Calcutta. He went not only to be of help to others, but he was also seeking a clear answer as how best to spend the rest of his life. His first morning there, John Kavanaugh asked Mother Teresa to pray for him. And so she asked him what he needed prayer for. And he said, well, pray that I have clarity. Pray that I have clarity. And Mother Teresa must have discerned that his, what his true need was because she said, no. No, I won't pray that way. She went on to say that clarity is the last thing you're clinging to and you must let go of. Kind of took him back. And when, when Kavanaugh commented that she always seemed to have the clarity he longed for, she laughed. And Mother Teresa said, I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I, I've never had clarity, she said. But what I've always had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. You see, God has his reasons for not revealing himself more clearly to us. And probably it's because that it's, it's essential to our spiritual growth to question and to ponder and to seek God as a thirsty person seeks after water. God has his reasons. And it just might be essential to your spiritual growth to question, to ponder, to seek after God. It's as 2 Chronicles chapter 15 verse 2 says, If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. It's like the song that, that Carrie and, and Susie sang a few weeks ago. 
The, the more I seek you, the more I find you. Yeah, that, that's, that's what he's after here. So, it's essential to us to understand God has his reasons. And we may not know or understand everything he does in our life. But we trust him still. Another thought. Most of us have certainty enough. Most of us have certainty enough. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17 and verse 20, that all we need is faith the size of a mustard seed and we will be able to move mountains. And, and right away our doubts, first thing, pop right up. Like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But that's what he said. All we need is faith the size of a mustard seed and we'll be able to move mountains. You see, it's not how much faith we have that makes the crucial difference in life. It's how much we love God and others. It's not how much faith. I hear it all the time. People say, just, I just need more faith. No, we just need to act on the faith we do have. Amen. You already have enough faith. If you have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you have enough faith. We just need to act on it. And that's where we're fearful. That's where we stop. So it's not how much faith we have that makes the crucial difference in life. It's how much we love God and want to please God and love others in that. The poet Robert Frost once spoke of the founders of this country and how they journeyed forth without a map. And they, saying that they did not believe in the future, they believed the future in. You're always a believing ahead of evidence. Frost continues, where is the evidence that I can write a poem? I just believe a poem in. The most creative thing in us is to believe a thing in. <laughs> then Robert Frost says, The ultimate example is the belief in the future of the world. We believe the future in. It's coming because we believe it in. So think about those words this morning. Think about those words. The most creative thing in us is to believe a thing in. Think about it. We believe in God and we see God's presence and power everywhere we look. We believe in God's kingdom but the real meaning of our lives as Christians it is to believe God's kingdom in. So listen carefully this morning. Unless Unless you have been taught to doubt. Unless you have been taught to doubt. The evidence for belief in God is overwhelming. And there's a lot of teaching about doubt. And that's where it comes from. If you're taught to doubt, then you will doubt. But unless you've been taught to doubt, the evidence for belief in God is absolutely overwhelming. I mean, just stop and think and look, look how amazing our world is and how complex it is. Could something, could something this wonderful have occurred without divine guidance? Really? Are you kidding me? You would have to strain all the credibility to believe that. For most of us, the world's, for most of the world's people, there is certainty enough to believe in God. Now, that's not to say that faith is to be accepted without careful thought. Because even Jesus said, Think about it. Consider the cost. Right? 
So Jesus didn't want you to just blindly believe. Think about it. Put some thought into it. So it's, we're not saying that faith is to be accepted without some careful thought being put into it. So that you know what you believe. In fact, let me just throw this out there. God gave us minds to protect us from gullibility. From, from, from gullibility to every silly idea that comes down the pipe. He gave us minds to think for ourselves. And we, we need to closely examine every new idea to which we're exposed to. Whether it comes from a preacher, whether it comes from a politician. Listen carefully. <laughs> I know this is a, a critical thing nowadays, right? Unless it comes, no matter if it comes from a preacher or a politician or a professor or a news publication or a TV personality. Just, just this week, twice, in fact, two different people's names of radio and TV personalities came up and said, well, this is, this is because they said it. Because they said it. That's why I believe that. I'm like, but what do you think? Well, I think that. No, you know you're thinking it because they told you to think it. My mouth gets me in trouble a lot. <laughs> Something came up last night that actually, in, from, from way, way back years ago, I mean years ago, and Susie said, Wow, you, well, I don't remember how to word that word. She said, wow, you were like that a long time ago? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I guess it was. But I'm, I'm just here to get, get our attention to think about what is really important. And to remind you, and let me just say, God does not honor gullibility. God does not honor gullibility. However, we will never make much progress in life until that moment when we take our stand, until we resolve in our own minds what we do believe and to whom we are committed. Amen. Amen. That's right. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's one thing we need to see. Blessed are the believers. And so, and then here's my final thought I just want to throw in there. Believers are a blessing to the world. Right. Believers are a blessing to the world. Just think about it. Where has there ever been a monument erected to the cynic or the critic or the doubter? Where has there ever been a monument erected for them? It's like someone has said, he who pulls on the oars has no time to rock the boat. I like that. That's, that's really good. Right? He who pulls on the oars has no time to rock the boat. Because you're too busy, right? You're too busy doing what's good. You're too busy doing what needs to be done. Rowing the boat. You don't have time to stand up in fear and... and, and Rocks the boat, and I have big time. I, I man, I'm, my brother used to drive me so crazy. We'd be out on this, and he he'd get scared. He was afraid of water. It took him forever to learn how to swim. But he and we'd be out there, and he'd just oh oh oh, and, you know. And he'd get up, and I'd just sit down, help me row, you know, because he's like. He, and sure enough, I don't know how many times he did this. So. <laughs> you can ask him about that many times when you see him next time. But that the way it goes, isn't it? You see. Believers are those who know that the world can yet be a better place. Amen. Just consider our own society. Who have been the builders? Who have constructed the, the hospitals, the great universities, the, the social service agencies? Behind everything. You will find people who hold in their hearts not cynicism, but hope. Not doubt, but faith. 
Not hostility, but love. In every one of them. <laughs> oh, I, I, this is all about, I probably ought to just keep my mouth shut, but I, I can't. <laughs> Would you be offended this morning if I said that most cynics are idiots? <laughs> Now, I, I mean that in the original sense of the word. Because I understand that the Greek word idios meant to look after one's own private affairs. And so the Greeks considered anyone who turned his or her back on the public good, who ignored the health and security of the, the whole society in order to look after their own affairs, they considered them an idiot. That's where the word came from. So now you know the rest of the story, right? An idiot is one who turns his or her back on the public good in order to look after his or, his or her own affairs. So now, you know, when I'm driving down the road or, or where, whatever I'm doing and I make a boneheaded move and I call myself a stupid idiot. I know probably you don't do that. So I want to ask you this morning, are you an idiot? I know that doesn't sound like a question I ought to ask from the pulpit. But are you an idiot? I'm merely asking, are you content with paying attention strictly to your own affairs and letting the rest of the world go to hell in a handbasket? That's all I'm asking. You see, believers are not idiots. They are people who know that if they make this a better place for their neighbors, they will also make it a better place for themselves. They have learned that the path to greatness is the road of service. Serving others. And it's, it's in the soaring language of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. He says, you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your noun and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love yeah. to serve. And then, Martin Luther King said this, and I think I included this in your notes. When evil men plot, good men plan. When evil men bomb and burn, good men must build and bind. When evil men shout words of hatred, good men must commit themselves to the glory of love. Mm. And speaking of, speaking of TV personalities, a prominent newscaster once put it like this. A successful person is one who can lay a firm foundation with the bricks others have thrown at them. <laughs> a successful person is one who can lay a firm foundation with the bricks others have thrown at So where are you this morning? On the side of the doubters? Or on the side of the believers? Where are you? Really, anybody can be a doubting Thomas. Anybody can be a doubting Thomas. It takes no particular strength of character to say, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. It takes no strength of character, really, to say that. But it does take strength of character to say, 
You know what? I don't have all the answers. But I know who is making this world a better place to live. And it's those who are followers of the man of Galilee. And I want to make my stand with them. I don't have all the answers. But unless someone proves otherwise, I will take my stand with those who believe that this beautiful world was the creation of a good and loving God. He's a good, good father. Amen. That's who he is. Amen. And I'm loved by him. That's who I am. Right. <laughs> Smart mouth and all. <laughs> you see, I don't have all the answers. But I believe that the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary has somehow changed this world forever. Yeah. And it's changed my life. I don't have all the answers, but put me down oh, as a believer. I'm on the side of the believers. I don't have to have all the answers. I just have to trust the one who does. Amen. So listen again to the words of our Lord to the disciple Thomas. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, do you want to be counted on the side of believers? <clears throat> you want to be counted on the side of believers? Well, give all your heart, give your heart and life to God today. And you'll be on that side. It doesn't mean you have to have it all figured out. Just give it to Him. Yeah, He'll lead you step by step. See, that's where, we, that's where we fall into trouble a lot of times because we think we have to have it all figured out before we come here. We don't have He says, just come just as you are. And if you'll come just as you are and trust Him, He'll see you through. I promise you that. You know, I maybe took a little bit of liberty and went a little long, but I if carry you to come to the piano. Something just tells me that I want to sing that chorus again. In light of in light of this passage, in light of this story, in light of these thoughts, that we would come to Him. Our doubts and all. Not that we have it all figured out. But as we sing this chorus again, open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. I want to see the possibilities in my life. I want to be able to trust you, Lord. I want to so open my ears so I can hear the Spirit's voice talking to me, leading me. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to, I want to see. I want to know what it is you have for me. And if you feel like if the Lord is dealing with you, you feel like you need to step out and come to the altar for the closing prayer, that, that's fine. Do that. I invite you to do that. But let's just sing that together. All right? Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. You reach out and Oh, 
Brothers and sisters, thank you for indulging me this morning to run it out a little bit. But it's always good to be together with my family. Always. And so today, we go today in the power and the assurance of God's presence that goes before us in resurrection power. <laughs> so may we not falter in our faith, but instead may we trust in God's faithfulness to us and be strong. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Thank you. God bless you. You are the